talking about maximum principle or necessary condition for optimality Okay, and we were talking about uh, the following problem. I have x t plus one, which is a function of x t comma u t. T equals zero to capital T. And then my cost function is j of u naught u t, which is g t plus one x t plus one plus summation t equals 0 to t g t of x t comma u t okay so we started with this problem we have studied the problem with where you only have a terminal cost we know how to solve that problem that's easy so now the goal is to solve this problem with the running cost okay so what should we do? Well, the idea is to augment the state space, so increase the size of the state space. So the new state space is xt plus 1, yt plus 1 equals ft xt ut and yt plus gt xt ut. And then with y0 equals 0. Okay, and then we say that the cost that I want to optimize u t is equal to g t plus one x t plus one plus y capital T plus one. Okay, so everything looks good now because now this is terminal cost dependent on the terminal state. Okay, and then we have the state transition function that depends on the state at time t and the action at time t. Okay, so this is your augmenting state space. Now we can solve the problem because we know how to solve the problem with terminal cost <clears throat> so let me write this as f tilde t x t y t comma u t okay What do I need to do? Well, I need to find the pt plus 1 at the final time. So I need to find the co-state vector. What is pt plus 1? Well, we'll have two co-state vectors, one corresponding to this constraint and one corresponding to this constraint. So let me write it as pt plus 1 and zt plus 1 equal to Anyone remember what the co-state vector was? Gradient x t plus 1, y t plus 1 of t tilde t plus 1. So that's equal to gradient x t plus 1, g t plus 1, and then 1. Rather, you know, I should write it as gradient g t plus 1 plus 0 and then 0 plus 1. So this 0 comes because this cap g capital T plus 1, it does not depend on y t plus 1. So 
that will yield 0 here. And then this one doesn't depend on yt plus 1, so that will be this 0 here. Okay, and then of course the differentiation of yt plus 1 with respect to yt plus 1 is actually equal to 1. So we found the co-state vector corresponding to the time step capital T plus 1, that's the terminal time. And now we want to find the co-state vector at time t. So how should we find that? So what would be my pt comma zt? Anyone remembers what that is? pt plus 1, zt plus 1, okay? That's the co-state vector at time t. Okay, so we need to find this part. How should we find that? So let's see. That's gradient of xt of ft, gradient of xt of uh, yt plus gt. Okay, so this is what the gradient is going to look like. Okay. What is the gradient of xt of ft? Well, that remains the same. What is the gradient of x, gradient of yt plus gt uh, with respect to xt? What's that gradient going to be equal to? Yeah, so zero plus gradient of xt with respect to gt because yt is independent of xt, right? So that gradient is going to be zero, and then all you are left with is gradient of gt with respect to xt. What about gradient of yt with respect to ft? Okay. So ft doesn't depend on yt at all, so that's going to be equal to zero. And then what's the gradient of yt with respect, gradient of yt plus gt with respect to yt? Well, that's one plus zero. Okay, any question so far? Yeah. Co-state vector, this is the co-state vector. Yes, so these are the states. So, you know, that's a very good point. What is a co-state? See, this idea of co-state vector has been around for a very long time, okay? Uh, this is, so before, so co-state vectors, so in short, co-state vectors are Lagrange multipliers corresponding to this constraint, okay? Now, why didn't they call it Lagrange multiplier? Why did they call it co-state vectors? You see, when people develop a theory, they want to give it some name, and if they are not familiar with some other name that's already out there, then, yeah, they give whatever name comes to their mind. So they gave it a name, well, this is co-state vector. That's 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 exactly true, okay? So the idea of 
Lagrange multipliers is quite old, but the people who developed maximum principle probably didn't know the term Lagrange multiplier, or rather they didn't usually, they didn't really think of co-state vector as Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this constraint, okay, which is why they call it a co-state vector. But it is a Lagrange multiplier, yeah. You can think of it in both ways. Remember, we introduced this problem as an unconstrained optimization and then as a constrained optimization. So if you think of it as an unconstrained optimization, then co-state vector is just a bunch of uh, derivatives, right, multiplied with each other. If you think of it as a constrained optimization problem with equality constraints of this sort, then co-state vectors are Lagrange multipliers corresponding to the equality constraint. This, this might sound very confusing to you at this moment, but bear with me until December 6th and everything will become extremely clear, <laughs> okay? Crystal clear. Okay, so, so this part is clear to everyone, okay? So now we can substitute that expression right here to get the value of PT and ZT uh, given the value of PT plus one and ZT plus one. So let's do that. So I have PT ZT equals gradient of xt ft multiplied by pt plus gradient of xt gt multiplied by zt plus 1 right and then i have 0 plus zt plus 1 Okay, so it looks like ZT is going to be equal to ZT plus 1, which will be equal to ZT plus 2, all the way up to Z capital T plus 1, okay? And we know that Z capital T plus 1 is equal to 1. So what that means is ZT is equal to 1 for all T. What, oh, this one is PT plus one, right. And this is ZT plus one, that's fine. Yeah, okay, everything is right. Thanks. Okay, so PT is gradient of F multiplied by PT plus one gradient of G multiplied by ZT plus one. ZT plus one is equal to one all the time. So, so I can really remove this, remove this, remove this and write 1, 1, and this is multiplied by 1, so that's fine. Okay. So my recursion is, uh, what about, what about gradient of u t of j, that's equal to gradient of u t of f tilde, multiplied by PT plus 1, PT plus 1, ZT plus 1. So we can do the same thing like that. So gradient of UT of F tilde T, that's equal to gradient of UT FT and gradient of ut gt. Oh, actually that will go on this side, so. Okay, so this is a row vector. Well, 
depending upon whether how many uh, so these are two matrices tagged uh, along each other so that gives me gradient of ut of f tilde t and then I can substitute it here to find Okay, so that's my gradient of ut of j. Okay, so we have the update equation here, the co-state update equation right here. And then we also have the gradient of ut, gradient of j, the cost with respect to ut that's given by this expression. And what this also says, well, I mean, it doesn't say it explicitly, but what it does is gives you a construction wherein a problem with running cost becomes equivalent to a problem with a terminal cost, right? By augmenting the state space, you can transform a problem with a running cost to a problem with a terminal cost. And then we can use the, um, the necessary conditions for optimality uh, to come up with a necessary condition for optimality for this running cost problem and that's given by this expression the so the theorem is if u u zero star u capital T star is optimal and let x one star x t plus one star be the corresponding trajectory. state trajectory then there exist p naught star p t plus 1 star such that gradient of u t f t P T plus one star plus gradient of U T G T is equal to zero for all T P star T plus one equals gradient of X T plus one G T plus one evaluated at the optimal trajectory and then P star T is equal to okay, that's a lot of gradients, but, um, but that's what the main result is. Okay. So this is uh, not the true statement of the maximum principle. So, but this is an this is an instance of the general idea of maximum principle. 
So the reason why we could say that derivative is equal to 0 is because the control space ut lies in the entire Rn. So it's an unconstrained optimization problem. So of course the gradient, the gradient of the cost with respect to ut should be equal to 0, right? Since it is an unconstrained optimization problem, the gradient has to be equal to 0. We all know it. We have studied it. We have uh, done all the computation so far uh, based on that idea. But what maximum principle says is instead of writing it this way, everything else remains the same. But this part changes. So in maximum principle, ut star is in the argument of ht of xt comma ut comma pt plus 1 where ht is defined as pt plus 1 transpose ft plus gt. Okay? So in maximum principle, instead of writing this derivative equal to 0 format, you actually write it as an argument of some Hamiltonian. So this is known as Hamiltonian. Okay, so you write it as a as a minimization of some Hamiltonian, which is defined in this fashion, where this pt plus one is actually the optimal co-state vector, or rather the optimal, or rather co-state vector corresponding to the optimal solution. And of course, this x t should be x star t, and this should be p star t plus one. Okay, so that u t star should be the minimization of the Hamiltonian. So why is it known as maximum principle when we are taking minimum? Any thoughts? Why is it called maximum principle when we are taking the minimum? Because the people who were coming up with maximum principle were actually solving a maximization problem, not a minimization problem. Okay, so that's why it's called maximum principle. But, so if, if you were, if you were solving the same problem, but you want to maximize the reward, you will take the arg max here, okay, of the same Hamiltonian. Because then you are maximizing uh, an objective function rather than minimizing an objective function. Okay, so in, in robotics, for instance, people usually use reward function instead of cost function. In controls, people usually use cost function instead of reward function. So there is some difference in terminologies, but the overall idea remains the same, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so this works for unconstrained case. This works for constrained case, okay? When ut is, uh, lies, in a, lies in some set, uh, capital ut. Now, so far, we have this Principle, how do we actually use it to compute optimal action in problems, in dynamic decision problems or dynamic optimization problem? So if you're driving and if you're coming up with an algorithm for an autonomous car, you have the current state, you know where you want to go. So what should, what should be the sequence of actions that you need to take so that the overall fuel consumption is minimized? Okay, let's say that's your objective function subject to some other safety constraints and reliability constraints and so on. So the question is, how do I, so given these, given the initial state and given the cost function, the overall cost function, how do I come up with the optimal set of actions or optimal sequence of actions? So here is the algorithm. And let's assume you are, uh, your ut, the action space is uh, the whole uh, Rn. So remember, this is your ut of j. So you want a 
so you initialize k equals 0 and ut u0 at k u1 at k u capital T at k okay so you pick some initial set of actions arbitrarily so that's your step 0 in step 1 well yeah in step k so you start with of course k equals 0 so in step k what is the first thing you have to do well you have picked a sequence of actions but you don't quite know what the state is going to be so you have to find the state so this is forward propagation find or compute x1 to xt plus 1 okay so what is x1 well x1 is let me also write it as k x1 at k will be f of x0 comma u0 at k and x2 of k will be f2 of x sorry f1 of x1 of k comma u1 of k and so on okay this is known as forward propagation those of you who work in neural network would know these terms by now right forward propagation so you come up with some initial guess you do forward propagation you get all these state variables then you do backward propagation you compute pt plus 1 at k all the way up to p0 at k okay you compute the co-state vector according to this fashion okay so pt plus 1 at k will be the gradient of xt plus 1 of gt plus 1 evaluated at xt plus 1 k and so on okay so I started I started with some random initial condition or not initial condition but initial sequence of actions that I want to take I do a forward propagation I get the values of the state corresponding to this sequence of actions then I did backward propagation and I get the co-state vectors in a backward induction fashion so I compute PT plus 1k first and then go all the way to P0 of k and then what do I know well I have to update my ut of k plus 1 will be ut of k minus some value alpha which can depend on k for instance but let's say your alpha is constant let me write it as alpha k alpha k and I want gradient of ut of j so I want this term right so what is this term equal to its gradient of ut gradient of ut of ht evaluated at xt of k ut of k and then pt plus 1 at k okay where this ht term is defined right here this is my ht okay and then you go back 
do the forward propagation with this new set of control actions, then do backward propagation, then update the control action, then go back to step K, do forward propagation, back propagation, update the control action, and so on. Okay, so whenever you are driving your car, you should know that this algorithm is running in the engine, okay? And not in the engine, but ECU, which actually controls the engine. So, so this, this algorithm is used heavily, including in the space, including in rockets and in spacecraft and so on. This algorithm is used heavily to compute the optimal, optimal sequence of control action that should that is needed in order to get your vehicle, in order to minimize this objective function that you might have formulated to uh, solve the problem, okay? Now, it is also used heavily in the field of machine learning because you can think of the weight vectors of the neural network as these values, u0, u1, all the way up to ut, and you do forward propagation, you do back propagation, you update the weights in neural network and then go back and redo the same set of things again. So I will definitely talk about neural network at some, maybe in the next class, and how do you actually implement this algorithm for, so I want to specialize this algorithm for neural network. So you will see what people do in, uh, when they are training a neural network because the algorithm is exactly the same algorithm, okay? No difference whatsoever, except that in this case, my ut is a vector, and in the case of neural network, your ut is actually a matrix, so it's not a vector anymore. So some of these um, multiplications have to be modified appropriately to solve the problem. So we'll talk about it in the next class. Uh, any questions? Yes? This might be stupid, but is, is this always converged when you do this? Well, when does gradient descent converge to the optimal solution? Yeah. So you have to, if, if, if J is, if J as a function of U1 all the way up to UT is positive semi-definite, then it will converge to the optimal solution. If not, it will converge to a locally optimal solution or it will converge to a saddle point, okay? And it's hard for any one of us to comment what's going to happen in a non-convex case, okay? Yes? J is a cost function. J is a cost function. Right here. You have to minimize the cost, yes. Right. So how, how is well, what we have shown in the last class and in this class is that gradient of ut with respect to j is the same as gradient of ut with respect, gradient of ht with respect to ut, okay? Because look at this expression. This is gradient of f multiplied by pt plus one plus gradient of gt, right? And that's the same thing. In Hamiltonian, you have pt plus one transpose ft. This doesn't depend on ut. This depends on ut. So you take the gradient here, and then you take the gradient here, right? And that's the same term. So it's not that, how is Hamiltonian helping you? It turns out that gradient of ut of j is the same as gradient of ut of ht. Okay, they are the same object. There's no difference whatsoever. Okay, the other thing is this Hamiltonian is related to the Hamiltonian you would have studied in your classical physics. Okay, they are not different. So in physics, whatever system you are trying to uh, study, it has its own objective function that it's trying to minimize, okay? Usually, a system goes from a high energy state to a low energy, no. A low entropy state to a high entropy state, okay? There's some, some such thing in physics. You know, my physics is weak, so I've forgotten everything that I studied in my first year of physics, okay? But there is a connection between the Hamiltonian you see here and the Hamiltonian you study in physics. Okay, and the connection is at a more philosophical level where each system is trying to optimize some objective function and the Hamiltonian for that function, Hamiltonian for that system is going to look very similar to the Hamiltonian here. 
and the of course origin comes from um, the similar set of uh, similar set of ideas in physics okay any any further question no so let's talk about dynamic programming we have 15 minutes okay i want to make one thing very clear in this case the value of ut you found is specific to the initial condition of the system okay remember your x naught was given right x naught is given so whatever u1 u2 u3 all the way up to ut you have found is for the case when x naught is given okay <coughs> So what happens over the course of the control? Remember, we started with a deterministic system. Okay, so your x t plus one was f of x t comma u t. But you know what? In every system, there is always some noise. Okay, there is always some noise w t, which is the noise term which means that x t plus 1 is not what you anticipate it to be but it's a slightly noisy version of what you actually anticipated what does that mean that the set of control actions you found is not optimal for this system okay the system with noise which is pretty much all the systems you will ever encounter in reality so we are in trouble right we are in trouble because now we have to restart the computation all over again we computed our optimal set of actions only to realize that the states that i anticipated is not this state but the state with some noise okay and that noise amplifies over a period of time okay so so that's a problem and so what you have to do let's say you are going from x0 to xn this is the trajectory you are taking well it turns out that the real trajectory is going to look something like this okay because of the noise and so now you have to run the algorithm at every point of time you have to run this backward propagation algorithm at every point of time in order to compute recompute the optimal control action knowing well that now you are standing at this state not at this state where you actually anticipated yourself to be so a more elegant solution would be such that if you plug in the actual state the current state you get the optimal solution by default okay you don't have to do this computation all over again and the solution comes from dynamic programming okay so let's move on to dynamic programming which is sufficient condition conditions for optimality that comes from dynamic programming so this kind of control is known as open loop control maybe some of you might have heard of this term before it's not a feedback control it's an open loop control those of you who have taken feedback controls class uh, would know that feedback is very good everyone loves feedback So feedback, so now we want to find xt plus 1 equals ft xt ut and your j of u naught to ut is equals to the same ok, so we are again trying to minimize the same objective function but now the goal is find optimal policy gamma star of t that maps x of t to u of t that maps the state space to the action space okay why is this different from this case 
because in this case this was not a function of xt at all okay ut star was not a function of xt at all it was a function of x naught right but not a function of xt in this case i want to find an optimal policy that's a function of the current state and it gives me the optimal action at the current time okay and i'm talking about 1953 okay uh, when so bellman was a scientist a uh, faculty in the us and uh, and ponte again and his students were faculty in russia so they came up with the maximum principle in russia around 1949 4849 and and then bellman came up with dynamic programming in the us around the same time um, they came up with this idea of dynamic programming bellman came up with the idea of dynamic programming so the principle of dp dynamic programming what it says is if gamma 1 star or gamma 0 star gamma t star is optimal then gamma t star gamma capital t star is optimal for every t okay so the tail of the optimal strategy has to be optimal for the overall sequence of strategies or sequence of policies to be optimal is this obvious is this obvious okay let's say this was 1952 okay and this paper was not out so you were completely you you just didn't know what what you should be looking for and so let's say i come to the classroom and i say that you know what if gamma not star to gamma t star is optimal then gamma not star well i could also say that gamma not sorry gamma 0 star to gamma star t is optimal for every t you know i could say that in 1952 because i didn't know the principle of dynamic programming i could say this but guess what this is wrong okay you if you want to be optimal your tail has to be optimal okay the the tail of the policy has to be optimal the head which is starting from time 0 to t star need not be optimal okay you don't care whether it is optimal or not all you need to do is make sure that this is optimal okay so this is false So let's see how we find the optimal policy. So how do I find the optimal policy? Well, I know that gamma t star all the way to gamma capital t star is supposed to be optimal so let's find gamma capital t star first and then move on to the uh, other optimization problem so how do i find gamma t star of x capital t well this is going to be argument of u capital t in UT. Okay, and in this case, you know that x t plus one is actually f t x t comma u t. So you will substitute it in there. and then what you have is an expression that depends on xt and ut and then you take the argument with respect to ut so all you are left is a function with respect to xt okay 
¿sí? So that gives you the optimal policy at the final time step. Yes. Right. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. So, let's say you go from some X naught, okay, so consider these two paths, okay, okay, and let's say you truncate, this is your time T, so your X T here and some X bar T here. You take one set of policy, you reach X bar T, and then you have this cost towards the end, right, which you will incur. And then you have this path pr until XT, from X naught to XT, and then you go all the way to XT plus one. It turns out, let's say this cost is optimal, you know, okay, this cost is very small. It turns out that this cost will be much, much larger, okay? So if you were running optimally at the beginning, if you think, if you made sure that your head is optimal, your subsequent cost will increase substantially, okay? Whereas in this case, even though the initial cost might be high, the subsequent co cost might be much lower. Not might be, it is going to be much lower as compared to any other trajectory, okay? Which is why that will be an optimal solution. Uh, no, no, that's not the case. Uh, so the question is, wouldn't it be more optimal if you optimize both head and the tail? Well, if you optimize the tail, you will reach here. If you optimize the head, you will reach here. How do you go from these, this point to this point at the same time step? Okay. So you can either do the forward optimization or you can do the backward optimization. And the backward one turns out to be the globally optimal solution. Okay. Of course, there is a more mathematical way of formalizing it, but don't have the time to do that. Well, you know what? I'll have to, uh, I'll have to start the next class with dynamic programming. Anyway, so let's see. So this is the gamma star t at the final time step, and then I say v of t at the final time step as the minimum of the same set of functions. So this is known as the value function, value function at time t. Okay. So we solve for the optimal policy at the final time step. Now I don't have the time. So in the next class, I'll talk about how do you compute the optimal policy at time capital T minus one, capital T minus two, all the way up to gamma zero, uh, using this idea of dynamic principle of dynamic programming. And then, uh, uh, and then we'll talk about neural networks or deep learning for a little bit. How many of you are actually interested in learning deep learning? You know, it's not a, it's not a, okay. A few of you, okay. Well, okay, fine. I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about deep learning from an optimization viewpoint, not from a deep learning viewpoint. Okay, so I'll talk about it in the next class. Okay, thank you guys. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.